here today with Quentin Martin. He's the CEO at Blackbox, uh, a sports betting platform that is preparing to go public in Toronto. Uh, Martin has also held different management positions at the Stars Group for over eight years. So thanks for having us today, Martin. And first, I would like to have your first insights regarding the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in the esports betting industry and Blackbox in particular, and how it has evolved since the outbreak began, especially after sporting events were shut down. Sure, um, pleasure to be here. Um, look, this pandemic, we're, we're, we're very lucky, um, those of us working in esports, that not only is esports and esports betting been resilient to the pandemic, but showing astounding growth at the same time. And, I think the key driver to that is less sporting events shutting down, but that's that's definitely a, a, a benefit to the esports industry. I think it's more of people going home, playing games again, um, using games to reconnect with their friends, touching base, the fact that esports is a medium that they can be viewed and watched. So I think we're seeing um, a big, you know, a, a systemic rise. I mean, uh, across the industry, we see esports betting has seen the value of a better increase 3x. Um, since before the uh, pandemic, we've we've seen it six six tuple, so so six x here at, at Lockbox. Um, I think one of the big trends has been, well, bigger trends has been the rise of FIFA and NBA 2K. So these were two titles which made up less than one percent of the betting volume beforehand, um, and these now account for between ten and twenty percent, depending on the operator of bet volume. And, and you know, we I, I suspect that that volume comes from you know, let's call them traditional sports bettors who have kind of migrated across to games that they recognise more easily and can bet upon. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people look ahead to see what will happen when we come out of this pandemic, whenever that happens. Um, and I think those games will decrease back to their kind of pre-pandemic size, or at least probably up a little bit where they were beforehand, but not hugely. Whereas I think. The, the majority of the uptick that we're seeing across the esports betting industry will, will stay about where it is at. It's basically accelerated esports betting and esports uh, a couple of years into the future with regards to its growth. And what was a uh, lackbox response to this new landscape with uh, strategies, partnerships, innovation in place or other resources were, uh, were implemented to address this unexpected scenario? Sure. So it was, it's basically in a perfect storm for us. I mean, our, our, pro, our product was up and running. The platform was already, but we needed to kind of add, uh, add fuel to the fire, so to speak. And we were just about to do that when the pandemic hit. And so we were, you know, we were, we were just primed and ready to go. So, I mean, what we've done to react to it um, is, for example, we now, we've added FIFA and NBA 2K. So we did have those pre-pandemic, because, of, as I said before, such low volume. So we've capitalized on that. Uh, we started scaling up. We've been we've been hiring during the pandemic to account for the, the just the growth of the company. You know, our operations team, um, you know, needed some assistance because we just had we were just growing too fast. Um, and we were we were scheduling a, an investment raise and, and a public listing, but we brought that forward um, so that we could you know kind of capitalize on the opportunity really and, and get that money to market and take advantage of the situation. So uh, our listing on the TSXD was brought forward a few months. Um, just so that we could capitalize on this opportunity and, and kind of get more money in while, um, you know, while there's opportunity there. Because, for example, not only is esports organic growth catapulted, but because traditional sports has kind of disappeared for, for 2020, um, a lot of the spend of traditional sports books has kind of evaporated from the space. So there's a lot, lot lower cost of acquisition. Um, and many affiliates and marketing agencies and similar mil middlemen are... Uh, are now flooding and saying, hey, you know, knocking on our door saying, hey, can we do stuff for you in esports? So we've got more marketing contracts than we can really execute at the moment. So that, that's another reason for bringing that forward. So we just want to capitalize and, and, and we've already, you know, we've been growing substantially since the pandemic began. Right. And, you, and can you tell us more about the, the feedback from investors, potential investors, um, and other outlooks and goals for uh, when, when, when you're actually public in Toronto? Yeah. So, well, firstly, I mean, this has been probably the most successful funding round that, that I've, I've done. I've, I've lost track of how many funding rounds I've done over the years um, for different companies. But um, this one has been by far, I mean, that, that perfect place, for perfect time, perfect product, perfect place just comes forward. So we set out to raise two million and um, the books close uh, end of this week. And, you know, it, it's already looking like we'll have raised several times that. So the reaction of the investors has been absolutely phenomenal, particularly because, when you look at the esports betting space, um, 
I think firstly, Luckbox is incredibly well valued um, with where we're at. You know, we've, we've got a fully, fully proprietary uh, website, um, mm. you know, our own license. It's all completely, the UI is completely catered to the esports better. Um, but in, in addition to that, if you compare us to, say, uh, uh, esports entertainment group, uh, you know, ViGG, which just listed last month on the NASDAQ, um, they're, they're trading at 55 to 60 million Canadian right now as their market cap. And our pre money for this round was. Um, was about 13 and a half and I, and I think our product is um, you know more advanced and and uh, you know so I think we just compare very favorably right now to our trending peers and and we're just in the right time at the right place so uh, and the, the investors have reacted accordingly so it's, it's great to have that vote of confidence well I let you have your your personal views on the on the esports very uh, integrity issues that are always very discussed and and the problem gambling measures that should be in place now that esports is starting to is going through a, a, a spike amid this this context absolutely so on responsible gambling i'll start there i think this has always been part of Lockbox's dna esports betting done right that's why we set out to, with the, to have one of the strongest gaming licenses in the space uh, and firstly my advice would be to stay away from any companies that have you know some of the, the less the less good like the curacao licenses exactly for example so there's um, I'd stick to the better licensed entities, you know, because we have like, all of the same um, anti-money laundering, countering and financing of terrorism, underage prevention, uh, cyber securities, player protections, etc., um, in place, exactly as you would if you walk into, you know, a William Hill or a similar kind of sports book in, in a traditional sports book space. Um, so that's part of our DNA, and I'm very happy with how we tackle that. To date, we haven't had uh, any issues. Touch wood. I mean, that's that certainly won't continue, but we'll stay on top of things. Um, then on the game integrity issues, this has always been slightly overinflated, I think, in the esports space because it's it's new, um, and everyone says, oh, well, the, you know, the, the, there aren't referees and whatever. Well, there are in the bigger tournaments. Mm -hmm. So I think it's only as prevalent in the tier in the tier three events. So if you think about it, like I'm going to use a, tenet, a traditional tennis example, Wimbledon, almost no integrity issues whatsoever. The prize pools are high. Everyone's watching. It's the same with the international, um, the majors, etc. In, in esports. Then the ATP 500s or 1000s, um, these tier two events also pretty good with regards to game integrity. Um, and then the tier three events, the qualifying circuits, um, this is where you start to see that they're the kind of more or less integral events. So we, we counter this firstly by doing our risk management in-house. So we take much lower bets on these lower, these lower tier of tournaments and much higher bets on the bigger tournaments. And we also work with ESIC, the Esports um, Integrity Committee, uh, to make sure that we, we feedback data, go back and forth and monitor it. And you know, we, I always like to think that the online sports books are the first to actually spot an integrity issue because you see erroneous betting plat, um, patterns, etc. So we're continually monitoring those with both algorithms and our, tr and our risk managers. So um, we're, we're, we're very happy to stay on top of that. But again, I, I just don't think it's as big an issue as before. Now, as um, we stay in this kind of COVID-19 pandemic world, where the tournaments are almost all held online rather than um, you know on fixed lands and you know in large arenas, you know there is maybe a slight increase of the of the risk of, of integrity issues. But again, it comes down to the same types of things: keep on top, monitor, lower risk appetite at the lower tier tournaments, and a higher risk appetite at the bigger. We will uh, discuss further the opportunities that um, are open in this country. You mentioned some of them. But uh, regarding the new new demands, new player profiles, um, in terms of innovation, uses of pricing technologies, educating new audiences in in, in esports betting, uh, how is, how is your your view on, on all these uh, these challenges and opportunities open uh, as of today? Sure. So I'll cut it into two. First, I'll talk about kind of the technology and the challenges. So everything that happens in the traditional sports book space is accelerated in esports because our audience are 18 to 38 years old. Um, they're the forefront of technology users, etc. So all of the demands for more in play betting, faster markets, to have the streams in, in play, etc. that you see in traditional are accelerated, and, and and that's why there's such a strict demand for um, vastly improved user interfaces to make sure, I mean, at Luckbox, we have 95% plus live streams for all in-play matches, so you can watch, chat, and bet in play. So, so that's something that we're, we made so when we set up our platform that we, we were ahead of the curve for. With regards to long-term you know, trajectories, I, I think that FIFA and NBA 2K will, will decrease a little bit. I think the rest will stay flat and continue to grow according to their, their pre-pandemic rate. 
um, you know, a key reason for, for us looking to go public on the Toronto Stock Exchange, a uh, venture stock exchange, is it'll be the, only the second ever uh, publicly listed esports betting company. So we want to be able to do some acquisitions. So um, the only part of the esports value chain that we don't do in-house right now is the actual odds creation. So we're in talks uh, and hope to make a, some announcement in the next three to six months along, along those lines. We also want to move uh, as a shift to B2B, not white labels. We don't want to do 10, 20, 30 white labels. Um, we set up our platform with our, um, because we had a focus on technology. Because I, when I, I come from PokerStars, you know, almost 10 years there. And you know, you, I know the technological challenges that they face and what the needs that they have from esports. They need esports betters so that they can acquire the younger generations and cross sell as part of their existing user base. We've set ourselves up to be able to facilitate for these bigger players. So you know, I hope to do announce a B2B deal in the next three to six months. Um, not, not many, maybe two or three with some of the larger players in the gambling space to, to become their bespoke partners on deep integrations. Um, and you know we'll we'll grow from there. Um, and the fact that we're we're so one of the few public companies means that our paper will be able to do some more acquisitions and grow in that way. So I see a lot of cost and revenue synergies and opportunities in the space. Right. Um, maybe we can round off with uh, some uh, landmark changes changes um, for the long term in the esports betting industry after the crisis. Um, long term projections. Um, and the role, especially the role that uh, technologies such as AI, uh, blockchain, or um, any any of these technologies that are being discussed today in the gaming industry will have in in those future scenarios for you. So, um, well, AI is my personal my personal hobby. It's my my absolute pet project. So I could talk about that forever. So I'll I'll, I'll try not to. So suffice to say that it will help improve how we calculate odds. Uh, and, and then on, on more obviously how we're going to work on our CRM with micro segmentation, more, more custom, more, more updated, more rapid uh, odds using essentially the big data that's collected in, in companies such as ours and, and the bigger operators. Long term trends. Um, for me, it's not esports e will take over from traditional sports. Um, it certainly will with regards to user acquisition for, for, for traditional gambling companies. It, it's not a question. Um, of if it's a, it's a question of when. So I would say somewhere in the next five to 10 years, probably nearer five, you'll start to see esports becoming the number one user acquisition channel for traditional gambling companies. I think that's going to be probably the biggest trend. I mean, my favorite statistic um, in all the research we've done is that um, 18 to 25 year olds watch, not play, they watch more computer games than traditional sports. So for, for me, that's uh, systemic of the change that's coming that, that that generation has 50 60 years of getting older before they're in retirement homes playing computer games against each other um mm -hmm. so for me I, I would say somewhere somewhere in the five to ten ten year mark if you have to put put me up to it i'd probably say about six or seven years we'll see esports becoming the number one user acquisition channel over traditional sports okay absolutely well uh thank you very much for your time and i hope i'll see you in another opportunity with show net Stay safe and good luck with your projects in Toronto. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stay safe.